Okay, be honest. You ever looked at the periodic table? I mean, really looked at the periodic table? No, really, really looked at the periodic table? And then thought about it a bit? What you might notice is that, hmm, something really doesn't make sense when we just look at the values. Remember, we have that atomic number. Well, that makes sense because it's the number of protons that we have in a particular version of an element. In fact, we know that that's what defines what the element is. But if we take a look down below, and we take a look at what we assume is the mass number, there's decimals there. Well, if that number is representing the mass number, which is the number of nucleons, protons and neutrons, that are in a particular element, hmm, how can we have decimal places? That's a good question. Let's take a look at a question that I get a lot. And that is, Mr. Key, what's going to happen if I get a certain percentage on my final exam? Because students know that it's not an equal weighting between what they do throughout the year and their final exam. So if we take a look at a scenario like this, where a student gets 78% on their coursework throughout the year we assign 70% of their mark, their overall mark, to the coursework throughout the year. And their final exam is worth 30%. Not at all an uncommon scenario. Now, if they achieve a 78% in the coursework throughout the year, and they have an off day, hey, it happens, on the final exam and get a 60%, one would expect that given the 70 and 30% weightings, that the mark should be closer to 78% than it is 60 and that's a reasonable assumption. Now, if they were weighted equally, we could just add up those percentages. Add 78 and add 60 and divide by 2. But these are weighted percentages, so we can't do that. Now, the way that we go about calculating this is to use a weighted average method of calculating. So what we're going to do, do is we're going to take the mark of 70, we're going to multiply it by the 78, we are going to add that to the mark of 60, multiply it by the 30%, and of course, because all of these values are uh, percentages and they're represented out of 100, we are going to divide the entire thing by 100 and represent it as a percentage. And when we do that, what we get is a mark of 72.6%. And you will notice that this is not right in the middle of these two numbers, rather it's more weighted towards the 78% as we would expect. Well, what does this have to do with isotopes? Well, not much, and yet Quite a bit, because you see, the way that we calculate that number that has the decimal in it on that periodic table is a weighted average of all of the known isotopes or all of the known versions of that particular element that occur in nature, that is, that are naturally occurring. So let's take a look at an example here and say that we have magnesium. Now magnesium has several naturally occurring isotopes. We have magnesium 24, and remember that 24 is an isotope symbol. It tells us that that is the mass number of that particular magnesium, so that those are the total number of nucleons, 12 protons, 12 neutrons that we have for that particular magnesium. There's also magnesium 25. Now remember, the atomic number, the number of protons can't change, so we know that in magnesium 25 we're now dealing with 13 neutrons, and we can also have a version of magnesium that has 14 neutrons. Now these are not equally occurring in nature, that is, their relative abundances, the percentages by which they're found in natural samples, is not equal. If they were, it would be 33%, 33%, and 33%. But it's not found that way. Instead, magnesium-24 is the most common version of magnesium, the most commonly found isotope, at a percentage of 78.7%. Magnesium-25 is at 10%, magnesium-26 is at 11.3%. So in a given sample of magnesium, we were going to find, anywhere in the universe, these percentages of these isotopes. Now, how do we use this to establish these values that we see on the periodic table? Well, again, we have to go back to our weighted average calculation. And the way that we go about figuring this is to take the mass and multiply it by its relative abundance, or its percentage, and add it to the next mass multiplied by its relative abundance of the next isotope, and so on and so on, until all of the naturally, ice, naturally occurring isotopes are considered. We divide the whole thing out of 100, and ultimately we come up with our value. And the value in this case is 24.29, and we can see that it's more heavily weighted towards the 24 than it is towards any of the other values because the magnesium 24 is the most common naturally occurring isotope. 
So one of the problems students run into when they're dealing with average atomic mass calculations is that they tend to add up all of the masses of the known isotopes and divide it by the total number of isotopes. So for example, for the magnesiums, they would add up 24, 25, 26, and then divide by 3. Now that would be okay if they were equally weighted, that is, each of the isotopes were equally represented in a naturally occurring sample of magnesium. That is 33%, 33%, and 33%. It's like dividing a pie into three slices that can be equally served to three individuals. Well, that's nice, and you're a really thoughtful person if you're sharing your pie with two other people, but isotopes don't work the same way. There is a weighted average, so we have to take those relative abundances or percentages into account. Now before you go, I should mention one more thing, and that is if you go back to the calculation that we did for magnesium, you will notice that it does not exactly equal the mass that you're going to find on the periodic table. And that is because those mass values that we use are uh, nice sort of round numbers. And in fact, when we're taking a look at those values, there's something else called relative atomic mass that has to be considered. But for the purpose of this vodcast and calculating average atomic mass, we're going to overlook that for this time. But if it is something that you want to study a little bit further, then I suggest that you do take a look into relative atomic mass. But hopefully this will allow you to better understand why we have decimal places on the periodic table rather than those nice round numbers that we did have when we were just looking at individual atoms. Remember, here we're talking about entire samples of an element, not just one atom. Thanks for watching.